to go ahead and do the presentation. Um, for Again, thank you guys for coming today. Um, got a little bit smaller crowd than we had last time, but um, like I said, we're happy to see everybody here. And hopefully as kind of more people get vaccinated, we can kind of continue to grow our numbers. Um, so today, when we were trying to think of a topic that we thought people would benefit from, one of the things that, that, that we're doing in our firm currently is we're prepping a case in federal court for trial. We're set to go to trial in the case on uh, the week of May the 10th. It's a declaratory judgment action um, from an insurance company. So I thought there's a lot of attorneys out there that are very unfamiliar with some of the major differences between federal civil cases and state court civil cases. So I thought we'd put together just a brief little presentation on some of the major pitfalls, the major problems that people experience um, when they go to federal court, just because of the, some, of, some of the procedural differences that there are. So let's go ahead and, and kind of jump in uh, just briefly here. So let's, let's talk at first about the Georgia federal court system. What does that mean? Where are the courts? Uh, what are the courts uh, do we have here in Georgia? So at the, in Georgia, at the federal district level, so this is the trial court level, we have three districts. We have the Northern District, the Middle District, and then the Southern District. Um, obviously, here where we are in Atlanta, in the metro Atlanta area, we're in the Northern District. The Northern District uh, is divided up and or has court presences in four different cities. Of course, the main court is in downtown Atlanta. The second one's in Gainesville, third one's in Noonan, and the last one's in Rome. So if you're assigned to the Northern District, it depends on what division you're going to be assigned to based on where the cause of action originated. So if, if it's in Atlanta, uh, here in Gwinnett County, um, pretty much all of our cases are in the Atlanta uh, division of the Northern District of Georgia. After the district court, then obviously we've got the federal appellate courts. And um, here we're very lucky because we have the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, which handles cases for Georgia, Florida, Alabama, um, for all three of those states headquartered right here in Atlanta. So we're very um, blessed this particular case has already been up that, that I told you we're going to try on May the 10th has already been up to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. And, uh, you know, it, it's very nice that we just can go downtown for oral arguments. We don't have to go down to Miami or to Florida or to Alabama. Um, the, the court will hold certain oral arguments in different states, but the majority of their operations are right here headquartered in Atlanta. So we're very lucky with that. So, Let's talk about some of those common federal court pitfalls for state court litigators. So if you're like me, you probably spend the majority of your time in state court. You probably don't get up to federal court that often, um, but when you do, it's really important to kind of refresh yourself on the rules and kind of remember uh, the importance of, of some of the differences between the two. And I'll mention this too. Obviously, we're not going to talk so much about the, the federal Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. Obviously, the odds of having a case go to the U.S. Supreme Court is, is very low. So our focus is primarily going to be at the district court level here today. So the first thing I want to look at are some of the pleading differences. Um, just right off the bat, there's some pleading requirements that are, differ from state court to federal court. The first major one is if you're like me and like this case that we have on May the 10th, one of the primary reasons you may be in federal court is because you're dealing with a declaratory judgment action with an insurance company. So what that means, what, it, what is a declaratory judgment action? A declaratory judgment action is when the insurance company basically sues your client on the basis of coverage um, because they want the federal court to make a determination as to whether or not coverage should apply. Now, these don't have to be filed in federal court but they generally, most of them are because of diversity jurisdiction. And I'm not gonna go down into a, a, a lengthy discussion of jurisdiction. But the first thing that you need to remember is the answer deadline is different because now you're, you're on the defense side, you're defending your client. They're gonna file that complaint for declaratory judgment. And the first thing is in state court, obviously you have 30 days to file an answer. In federal court, it's only 21 days. Um, this is a common problem that a lot of uh, 
predominantly state court litigators run into, they forget this change and then the case slips into default uh, because they don't file their answer in time. Second kind of major thing to be aware of kind of in the onset of the pleadings of the case, when the defendant files a motion to dismiss in state court, that tolls the discovery period for 90 days. So that kind of causes everybody to kind of say, well, let's hold off, let's not spend any money on discovery until we know for sure that this particular case is not going to be dismissed. Um, of course, if the 90 days expires, discovery automatically starts if we still don't have a ruling on the case. That doesn't happen in federal court. So just because the defendant files a, a motion to dismiss in federal court, the discovery period still starts and the clock still keeps ticking. So be sure that if you ever see a motion to dismiss in federal court, which a lot of times you do, just because you see it's, it's a heavily motions practice in federal court, just know you've got to stay on the ball regarding the discovery. Um, some more pleading uh, differences, um, amending the complaint. You know, in state court, you can pretty much amend as a matter of right anytime up until the entry of the PTO. It's not like that in federal court. Federal court, you only have 21 days after the response of pleading. So you have 21 days after the answer to file an amended complaint. And generally, you can only amend once as a matter of right. Um, once those 21 days have expired or you've amended the complaint, you would have to seek leave of court. You need to get an order from the court authorizing you to do so. And in our experience, judges in federal court are very hesitant to allow amendments unless it's some gross injustice uh, that, that, that basically was not discoverable at the outset of the case. So definitely want to make sure you, you amend your complaint uh, timely. Um, in state court, this is another thing you remember if you're on the defendant side, there's no answer required for an amended complaint, not in federal court. In federal court, there is an answer requirement. So again, if you, like me, find yourself in a deck action and you get an amended complaint served on you by the plaintiff, you are obligated in that situation to file a new answer to that amended complaint. I put this, uh, this is important. I put formatting, 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 um, because that is one of the major differences in federal court. Obviously in the state court, we have formatting requirements, but the reality is, is in most state courts, more, most court clerks are not gonna reject your pleading because of formatting issues. That is not the case in federal court. So if you file a response to a motion, for example, and it does not fit the formatting to the local rules, uh, the letter of the law, they're gonna potentially reject that filing. And obviously that becomes an issue when you have a deadline and, um, and you have something due, and then that pleading gets rejected for a formatting issue, you may have just missed the deadline to file that responsive pleading. So a good idea in federal court is to go ahead and file your responsive pleadings two or three days before they're due, just in case the clerk's office uh, ends up kicking it back for some, some sort of formatting requirement. I put this in here, read the local rules. Every court, district court has different requirements. And so there's no one size fits all, but generally there's a larger font size required, specific font types that are required. There's a larger top margin requirement. So the margins can, can be kicked back if your margins are incorrect. And generally there's a certificate of compliance requirement as well. Um, what a certificate of compliance is, is basically just like you have a certificate of service in state court, you are basically stating that the, that pleading is specifically complying with all of the local rules. And a lot of times if you fail to include that certificate of compliance, the whole pleading will be kicked back. Um, other required federal filings. So there's a few other filings that we have in federal court that we don't have in state court. The corporate disclosure statement is one. Um, Let's say you represent a corporation in federal court. Um, one of the things you're required to do is file a disclosure of all the parent companies that are involved, um, just so that there's no uh, ambiguity as far as who the, the, the parent companies are. Um, a certificate of interested persons is also important. Um, this is all of the entities that have a financial stake in the case. And why, do, why does federal court require this? It's because the judges have to make sure that they are not conflicted out from hearing a particular case. So they may be a stockholder 
in a company that is a parent company of somebody that you are suing, they, in that situation, could be required to step aside and not be authorized to, to hear that particular case. So very important. There's specific deadlines of when these have to be filed, usually very early on in the case. Federal court also has much more stringent standing order requirements. I know we see standing orders in state court cases, but the reality is, is that um, we don't see them as strict uh, as we see in federal courts. So when you get that standing order, read it, open one screen with that, open your other screen with the local rules, and go ahead and calendar out all the deadlines in the case. There's some major discovery differences as well. Um, federal court does something that I actually wish we would do in, in state court. Um, there's an initial uh, planning conference. It's called a Rule 26 conference. Uh, the plaintiff is obligated to organize it. Generally, it has to happen around 16 days after the answer, but again, read the local rules. And in that conference, you're discussing item two here, which is the joint preliminary discovery plan and report. And what that is, it's, it's the parties putting their heads together saying, hey, how are we going to ta uh, tackle discovery? Are there any complex issues? Or is there going to be an enormous amount of documents? How are we going to deal with that? Um, what do you think you have? What do we think we have? And it just kind of garners that good faith between everybody regarding discovery. And you basically complete a form uh, joint preliminary discovery plan and report. These forms are on the court's website. You fill it in, um, and then that has to be filed generally 14 days after the conference. Another good thing about this, just a practice pointer, is that there's a requirement that you discuss settlement here too. So it kind of gives you a good kind of understanding of, hey, I think we can get this resolved maybe early, or it may be something where they say, hey, let's do the, some discovery, then let's revisit this later. Another thing that I uh, wish they did in state court that we have in federal court is initial disclosure. So in federal court, you were required to file what's called initial disclosures in addition to responding to any sort of written discovery that's out there. Again, there's a form available online. Generally, you have about 14 days from the answer, um, 30 days um, in the Northern District of Georgia. But I will say this, in most cases, the parties will stipulate to a new date by agreement. So the court, their local rules say, this is the due date, but if the parties come up with their own dates, uh, I'm okay with that. And so generally, this is something to discuss in that joint preliminary conference and say, are you guys okay if we, maybe we push out our initial disclosures another 20 days? And if everybody agrees, that'll be the due date for those initial disclosures. But this is very important. They have to be accurate, those initial disclosures, because if you fail to disclose a witness or a document in those initial uh, disclosures, um, that can result in, in its exclusion from evidence. So if you knew about it, if you had this document in your possession, it's not turned over or not mentioned in the initial disclosures, be prepared that the uh, court may have you um, explain why it was not included and, and you could run the risk of that being excluded from evidence. So something definitely to be forthcoming, to provide the information. Um, and it's also a nice way to get the, uh, the other party's information early on without having to serve those interrogatories or requests for documents. A couple other written discovery differences. Um, big one, uh, you're limited to 25 interrogatories in federal court. This becomes an issue a lot of times where you have a case that's removed from state court. If you filed interrogatories with the complaint and it's over 25, you may want to withdraw those and kind of pick your favorite 25 and send them in again. Um, that could potentially be an issue, um, but you are limited to 25 interrogatories in federal court. Um, there's a stricter duty to supplement. It's an ongoing duty. You have to supplement those interrogatories and RPD responses. And there's also stricter deadlines. So. Um, discovery periods in federal court often will not be extended. So it is, it's always important in state court, but it happens. Sometimes you're sitting there in state court, you realize, oh, three months have gone by. We never took that deposition. Let's call and get it scheduled. You really can't do that in federal court. You've got to be on it because a lot of times that judge will not extend that discovery period. And once that discovery period ends, you're out of luck if you have other, other items of discovery that you wanted to accomplish. Um, so motion practice differences, um, it's strict timelines for filing. Um, a lot of times these are governed by scheduling orders. So things like Daubert motions, motions for summary judgment, motions to compel generally will have in the standing order strict deadlines of when those need to be filed. Um, if of course it's not filed by the deadline, 
in most courts, you've then waived your right to, uh, to pursue that, that motion. Um, there's also some shortened response times. Again, I know I sound like a broken record. Read the local rules very closely. Um, generally, in the Northern District of Georgia, you have only 14 days to respond to motions. Compare that to state court where you have 30 days. That's a very big difference. They so graciously extend that if it's a motion for summary judgment, but generally only to 21 days. So again, read the local rules. These, these dates are constantly changing. They might also be changed by the standing order, uh, but just be aware. Don't just assume that your deadlines are exactly the same as they are in, in state court. Another thing on the motions, there are very strict page limitations. We, a lot of times in state court, don't have page limitations. If you want to file a 50-page response to a motion, you're entitled to file a 50-page response to a motion. But in order to do that in federal court, you need leave before it's actually filed. Um, this, is a, this is a big one. If you only take one thing uh, home with you today, this is the thing that I think is most important. In federal court, there's generally no right to dismiss and refile your case within six months. So in state court, I know it's a, it's a big tool as a plaintiff's lawyer that we have to dismiss your case without prejudice, refile within six months, um, and that will often toll the statute of limitations and will allow you to proceed with the case with a new filing. That does not happen generally in federal court um, unless you have a court order uh, before the dismissal which approves it, or a stipulation among the parties that's going to allow you to dismiss and refile. Um, this is right for legal malpractice, where if you just assume you're in federal court, well, I'll just file a dismissal without prejudice, you file it, well, you might have just waived your client's right to be able to come back in and then refile the lawsuit. So definitely something you need to be aware of, big issue in federal court, big difference between state court cases. Last, I threw a couple of these in, uh, some, some differences between federal trials and state court trials. The, the biggest difference is the formality. Um, going and just walking into a federal court, um, there's requirements, there's things called blue cards. If you're an attorney and you have a trial coming up, you probably want to go down a month or two before the trial and get a special ID made as the lawyer. That allows you to bring things like your cell phone, um, your, uh, your, your laptop, things like that into court that you would otherwise not be able to unless you had that card. Um, they, they're so, but there's a lot more formalities. It's a lot more, um, lot more strict on some of the requirements, the evidentiary requirements. They're not going to let you get away with some of the arguments and things that you would have done in state court, or maybe you're a little more fast and loose with some of the arguments and things until you get an objection. You really kind of have to toe the line a little more in federal court. Another kind of major difference is in board year. A lot of times the questions must be submitted to the judge. Um, generally, and this is around the time of the PTO, and that judge will actually approve or deny your questions. Um, a lot of times that judge won't even let you read the questions. They will be the one to read that question to the potential jurors. So Obviously, with the federal rules of evidence, that's something I know that everybody can go look up. And in Georgia, since we've kind of adopted our own version of the federal rules, there's not as many changes with that as there used to be, like when I first started practicing. But still another thing to familiarize yourself with some of the federal rules of evidence, um, maybe some of the things in the standing order about how the trial will be conducted. These are all things to kind of familiarize yourself before the trial. So that's pretty much all that I have. Um, basically regarding um, federal court cases and the differences, the major differences between federal court and state court cases. But again, I still recommend that you, anytime you get a federal court case, I do it every time I've been doing cases in federal court for now for over 10 years. And I still, every time I get served a new federal court case, I sit down, I read the local rules, I diary out all the deadlines just because the importance of it is so great in federal court. Um, but that's pretty much all I have. Anybody have any questions or anything? Okay, we got a question. Does each judge have his own rules or is it just one set of local rules? That's a great question. So uh, the question was, does each judge have their own set of rules or is it just one common set of local rules? So each court has their own set of, of local rules. So. The Northern District of Georgia has their own set of local rules. The Middle District has theirs. The Southern has theirs, um, which a lot of times will somewhat change the federal rules of evidence. I mean, the federal rules of civil procedure, 
which apply to all of the all the courts. Um, but then you also have each individual judge who has their own rules in their standing orders. So it's kind of a tier system. You have the federal rules of civil procedure. You have the local rules for the district court that you're in, or if you're in the 11th Circuit, um, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, which is going to govern the brief and those kind of things. And then you also have uh, your, your standing order, which will present even more rules for that specific judge's requirements. And uh, like I said, if, if you have a case like us, like this case we're about to try, that goes up on the 11th Circuit, they have their own host of own rules. They require certain hard copies to be filed, certain color requirements for the cover. Just if you get a case that gets appealed to the 11th Circuit, just sit down, read those rules cover to cover. It'll take you 20 or 30 minutes and just refresh yourself on those requirements. Okay. All right. Well, thanks again for coming. Um, like I said, we do these monthly, so we'll see everybody next month. And uh, we're going to continue to grow. And if anybody has any topics they want to suggest, um, I'm more than happy to hear them. We're also going to maybe start bringing in some other guest speakers as well. So I look forward to seeing everybody next month. And thank you for coming. Thank you.